Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio. Brought to you by OnPay. Built in Atlanta, OnPay is the top rated payroll and HR software anywhere. Get one month free at OnPay.com. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio, and this is going to be a very interesting one. I have with me Bryce Gillespie with the Hand and Upper Extremity Center of Georgia. Welcome, Bryce. Morning, Lee. Thank you very much for having me. Before we get too far into things, tell us about the Hand and Upper Extremity Center of Georgia. How are you serving folks? Yeah, so we are a practice of six orthopedic surgeons who just specialize in upper extremity, so hand, wrist, shoulder, elbow issues. Um, our main office is here in Atlanta, uh, adjacent to Northside Hospital and Scott Ashoyed Hospital, and our other offices are further up 400, uh, serving Al- Alpharetta and Cumming. Uh, but we have been in practice for over 45 years and uh, provide this specialized care to children uh, as well as adults uh, who have issues with their upper extremities. And certainly things have been changing recently for us, but we've been adapting to that uh, and uh, try to continue to serve our patients as best we can. So now how has this uh, coronavirus impacted your practice? So one of the biggest changes, obviously, is being able to safely provide our services to patients and provide it in a way that's uh, beneficial to them, but obviously uh, maintaining their safety as well as our staff's safety. Um, And certainly uh, in response to that, we have, uh, seen a, a decrease in our overall volume. It's probably at least uh, 60% less office visits that we're seeing. And certainly on the surgery side, given that all elective surgeries have been canceled, we're probably only doing maybe 15 to 20% of the surgeries we'd normally be doing in this time. Uh, we had to make a, a decision about how to respond to that. One of them was to uh, really contract our office presence here in the short term. So currently we've actually closed up two of our offices and really focused all of our energy here in our main office, again, uh, near North Side Atlanta and Scottish Shrine Hospitals, and really providing our care based out of that one office instead of uh, your three full-fledged offices that we would normally be having. And in looking at that, we wanted to provide uh, a way to still reach our current patients as well as new patients that would allow them to do so remotely. And that's where we started to uh, offer telemedicine health Uh, here in just the past couple of weeks. So now when you're kind of making that pivot to lean more on technology and telemedicine, how was that in terms of, uh, how'd that go in terms of rolling it out to the team and start executing? And what have you learned thus far? Right. Well, it certainly was a new process for us. Obviously, there had been some engagement uh, online through a patient portal and obviously phone calls and things like that that have been retained for a long time. But really, we had never made the investment in understanding uh, how to do this as well as uh, how to do it effectively and and what are the appropriate patients to do that. So pretty quickly, uh, we resourced, uh, you know, amongst other colleagues, amongst some of the various professional organizations that we belong to, uh, what resources were out there to provide this. Uh, Currently, uh, we are using uh, an online platform, uh, it's uh, doxy.me. Uh, and that's a HIPAA compliant or a privacy compliant uh, platform that allows uh, an online uh, real time audio and visual communication between a patient and a provider. Uh, and so we had to uh, start to go through our schedules and identify patients who you know had already been on the schedule from before that we thought would be appropriate for this. They could provide a, maybe a follow up visit to check in and see how they've been doing. Certainly some people after have had, you know, if they had been having surgeries in January and February and March and just needed a quick check-in, that we could do this remotely instead of having to bring them all the way into the office. So now this might be something that even after the crisis kind of goes away that you might be able to lean on a little more than you had historically? Right. I think that's uh, a, good, a big question now. Certainly here in the short term, the government has actually made some changes to the regulations regarding telemedicine that has made it much more uh, uh, easy to roll out um, and, and certainly uh, has limited some of the financial investment that people have to make in some of the platforms that are typically used for telemedicine. 
so I think if we certainly see that some of those restrictions uh, are brought forward into the future and make it a little bit easier, I think it'd be a great resource. But I think at the same time, we are understanding uh, when and how this can be implemented. And I do think that it would be something that would be great uh, to maintain for our patients in the future, for sure. Now, um, with all the burdens on the hospitals and emergency rooms, uh, how are you, is there any way that you can help when, especially with all the kids home now, I'm sure there's, that doesn't uh, yeah. make all the hand, wrist, and elbow injuries go away <laughs> when they're hanging out at home right. playing. Uh, how, yeah, how are you helping are. in that area? So we've certainly reached out to our uh, our neighboring hospitals and obviously the, the ones that we uh, provide some of those emergency services to our, our Children's Health Care of Atlanta and Northside Hospital. Um, and certainly we've made it, uh, it aware to them and the ER staff that we are available. So if there is any way that they can start to triage uh, some patients, you know, essentially from the front door, we can certainly see them over in the office. At the same time, we've had outreach to, you know, our typical pediatricians and internists uh, who would make referrals. And again, I've had uh, certainly had a pediatrician uh, who did a telemedicine visit for one of her patients about a finger injury, called me up, and then I subsequently did a telemedicine visit with that patient and eventually saw them in the office when it was appropriate. Um, but in that way, we are continuing to extend our resources and trying to you know, keep patients and families as healthy and as far away from uh, the emergency rooms uh, and offices when it's appropriate. And then when they need to, we bring them in. Uh, but that has certainly been something we've been trying to do to, to decompress, uh, you know, our emergency rooms that we work with. Now, any advice for the parents out there when they do have their kids running around to uh, ways for them to help their children stay safe? I think the biggest thing is obviously just trying to uh, keep an eye on them. Um, certainly, uh, I have found uh, that uh, uh, people young and uh, old are starting to get into some uh, various uh, outdoor equipment and uh, power tools and things that they may not normally be around. So I think that's one of the most important things. I've seen several uh, uh, you know, yard uh, power tool uh, incidents here, and some of them have been even young children. Um, and so either it's identifying that if there's a tractor or a lawnmower or a hedge trimmer that's out and being used, that everyone stays away from that and that nothing goes uh, um, you know, unwatched in that regard or unattended uh, if there are power tools and other implements out in the, out in the lawn and in the yard now that most people are doing a lot of home improvement projects, same way on the inside that there's not power drills or other sorts of tools or saws that are laying around inside unattended either. Now, now, you mentioned when you were kind of researching telemedicine and you were going to start implementing some of that, uh, you leaned on the associations that you're a member of. Can you talk about um, how that kind of education happened and how you were able to get the team kind of trained up in order to do telemedicine effectively? Because there had to be some sort of a learning curve on how to effectively leverage that technology in this new platform. Right, there certainly were. Uh, the uh, professional organizations, again, uh, some of them are based uh, with the hospitals that we're affiliated with, and then certainly us as orthopedic surgeons. We have uh, national societies for orthopedic surgeons, and specifically uh, the American Society for Surgery of the Hand, which is hand surgeons across the country. Uh, and they certainly did anywhere from uh, you know, blog posts uh, to webinars to just compiling resources because, again, when you're looking at this, it's not only identifying uh, an effective platform uh, and the software and hardware to use, but also understanding uh, what the insurance companies are doing about this. Again, they have, have changed their guidelines pretty significantly, and that was almost changing on a daily basis as to which insurance companies would allow you to do the telehealth, how we bill and code appropriately, um, uh, one of the nice things is that most of the insurance companies have actually started to waive co-pays for patients for telehealth visits. So typically, if, you know, they may have to pay $25, $35, dollars copay to come into a doctor's office, and typically they may be responsible for that for a telemedicine visit. But off, right now, for most of the insurance companies during this pandemic, they have waived those fees. So again, it's to try to allow people this method to access their physicians and making it as affordable and easy for the patient and the provider as possible. Now, um, I would imagine in this case, 
you're leaning on telemedicine for a brand new patient or at least somebody that is has a question maybe or wants to kind of interact with a doctor that has never done telemedicine themselves from their end is there any kind of coaching for that person like because how does that happen you know if i'm a, right. a patient and i've never done this this is new to me like it's new to you so imagine yeah. for me this is really uncharted waters here uh, it is, and and certainly uh, we're learning on the go a little bit regarding that because oftentimes you know there are there are limitations as far as how much we can examine a patient. Uh, again, a lot of it can be gained by their description and how they're describing their symptoms, but certainly uh, we uh, you know sometimes physically have to take a step back from the the webcam uh, and demonstrate something and have them do it for us. And it, it may be something that we are having them position their arm in a certain way and asking us, does that make your hand feel numb or does that make your elbow feel numb? Those sorts of things uh, are coachable moments, and we are certainly learning on the fly. Uh, but I think that it, looking to the future, if we were to do more of this, we'd probably come up with some more standardized ways uh, of communicating that, whether or not it's small tutorials or a, a worksheet that can be passed along ahead of the visit to say, hey, you know, these are the things that we're probably going to ask you to demonstrate uh, and try to do that in a more regimented fashion. Because, yes, it certainly is a, a learning curve, um, even from the fidelity of the image on the screen. It's, it's not the best, but it certainly gives us the ability to really uh, understand what they're concerned about and, and coach them. It can either be guidance that, yes, I think we're in a good position or, you know what, this is concerning enough. I think it is worth having you come into the office and we'll make every effort to get you in the office quickly and as safely as possible. Now, from the patient standpoint, is this something they use their laptop or can they use their smartphone? Like what technology is required from the patient standpoint? Yeah, so for the most part, they can use any uh, smart uh, device uh, or or their laptop. Um, a, you know, the the platform we're using is a web-based uh, platform, uh, and so they can, they get an email uh, with a link that allows them to check into essentially a virtual waiting room, and they can do that from their phone or tablet or uh, desktop. Uh, some of the platforms out there would require them to download an app. Um, that's not the one that we're using, but there are some that may require a little bit more work ahead of time. Ours is, is, is as easy as clicking on a link that we would email to the patient ahead of time uh, after they've requested an appointment. So the bottom line is you're open for business. You might have kind of uh, have one main office right now where people can go into, but you're available to help if the if somebody has an issue regarding uh, you know their hand or their wrist or their elbow or their shoulder, right? Definitely. We are here and, and, uh, and certainly uh, more than willing to be available to them. And, and again, uh, certainly there are uh, urgent and emergent reasons to do that. But also even in this time when people uh, are focusing on some issues that maybe they've put on the back burner for a while, uh, we are more than willing to uh, start to engage them. And it may be through a telemedicine visit that we engage them initially. And then once things have quieted down a little bit in the next few weeks, maybe they do uh, you know, present to us in the office and we get to have a, a full discussion or a full examination then. But at least we've started the process. We can even start coaching some treatment. You know, there are certainly over-the-counter things and things that they can try around the house to help alleviate some of those symptoms that they're having. And I think it goes to giving them a, 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 a good peace of mind that they've at least uh, had somebody understand a little bit about what's going on. They have a little bit of a framework in mind, knowing that it may still need some more treatment or more diagnosis or evaluation in the future, but we are here for them for sure. Now, if somebody wanted to learn more uh, about the practice, what's the website? Yeah, so our website is www.handcenterga.com. Handcenterga.com. Well, Bryce, thank you so yeah. much for sharing your story and thank you for uh, helping out in the community. And, and um, I mean, I'm sure you're creating a lot of peace of mind for people who might have injuries and also you're able to kind of triage some situations that might need, you know, urgent care. Definitely. Yeah. We are here to, and, and available and, and appreciate the opportunity. All right. Well, this is Lee Cantor. We will see you all next time on Atlanta business radio. Today's episode of Atlanta Business Radio is brought to you by OnPay. Built in Atlanta, OnPay is the top-rated payroll and HR software anywhere. 
Get one month free at onpay.com. 